a martyr's death. No reasonable person looks forward to pain, beatings, persecution, or a violent death. But wanting it or not, death comes to all of us. Shouldn't one's death count for something? Shouldn't a believer's death be a worthwhile event? Make a lasting impression on those who watch, cause it, or learn of it later? Shouldn't our deaths make a difference? This month, we are taking a look at the character quality of endurance and learning the history of the hymn, The Son of God Goes Forth to War. Written in 1812, this is a hymn by Reginald Heber, a song written especially to celebrate St. Stephen's Day with verses 3 and 4, referring to Stephen as the first martyr of the Christian faith, as we find in Acts 7, 55-60. Based on Zechariah 14.3, the poet wrote these following lines. The Son of God goes forth to war, a kingly crown to gain. His blood-red banner streams afar. Who follows in his train? Who best can drink his cup of woe, triumphant over pain? Who patient bears his cross below? He follows in his train. That martyr first whose eagle eye could pierce beyond the grave, who saw his master in the sky and called on him to save. Like him, with pardon on his tongue, in midst of mortal pain, he prayed for them that did the wrong. Who follows in his train? A glorious band, the chosen few on whom the Spirit came, twelve valiant saints, their hope they knew, and mocked the cross and flame. They met the tyrant's brandished steel, the lion's gory mane. They bowed their heads, the death to feel. Who follows in their train? A noble army, men and boys, the matron and the maid. Around the Savior's throne rejoice in robes of light arrayed. They climbed the steep ascent of heaven through peril, toil, and pain. O oh God, to us may grace be given to follow in their train. St. Stephen's Day is December 26 and remembers the willingness of Stephen to endure the test of faith, as should we all be prepared to do. The Son of God Goes Forth to War is most often sung to Henry Stephen Cutler's 1872 tune, All Saints New. Published in 1872 in the hymnal with tunes old and new by John I. Tucker. Reginald Hebert was born at Malpas in Chester, England, on the 21st of April in 1783. He was the son of Thomas Heber and Elizabeth Atherton. Educated privately and at Brasnose College, Oxford, where he pursued a brilliant university career, Heber won the prize for the Carmen Seculare, a Latin poem on the beginning of the new century. That would be 1800. The prize for English verse on the subject of Palestine, and the prize for the best English prose essay on the sense of honor in 1805. In 1805, Heber gained a fellowship at All Souls College, after which he spent two years traveling in Germany and Russia. In 1807, he returned to England and took holy orders, married Amelia, the daughter of Dr. Shipley, Dean of Asaph, and became rector at Hodnet, Shropshire, England. Heber had a strong academic career and often wrote poetry. In 1812, he became prebenary of St. Asaph, 1815, Bampton Lecturer at Oxford, 1822, Preacher at Lincoln's Inn, and in 1823, he became, somewhat reluctantly, the Anglican Bishop of Calcutta, India. Now, the See of Calcutta had been established in 1814. It covered much of the Indian subcontinent and Ceylon, now known as Sri Lanka together with Australia and parts of Southern Africa. The first bishop, Thomas Middleton, who had been consecrated in 1814, died in office in July of 1822. At the time, the head of the Indian Board of Control was Charles Williams Wynne, an old Oxford friend of Heber's. In December of 1822, Williams Wynne wrote to Heber, not directly offering his friend that post, the wording appeared to anticipate a refusal, but nevertheless left Heber the opportunity to claim the office should he wish. Now Heber had a long-standing interest in the work of overseas missions. He supported its more recently formed evangelical sister body, the Church Missionary Society, known as CMS. And while still at Oxford, 
had helped to found the British and Foreign Bible Society, also known as the BFBS. Heber was attracted to the post in India, his interest in distant places having been stimulated by his earlier travels, but his initial response to the implied offer was rather cautious. He first asked Williams when, whether there was a suitable local man for the appointment, and he was told there was not. His next concern was whether his wife and infant daughter should be exposed to the rigors of the Indian climate, and also if his own health. After consultation with doctors and discussion with his family, Heber wrote to Williams Wynn on 2 January 1823, refusing the post. Within days, he had written again, though, regretting that refusal and asking if the post was still available, at which Williams Wynn quickly obtained the formal approval of King George IV to the appointment. Heber spent the next few months at Hodnet, preparing for his departure, during which this period he gave a farewell sermon at Oxford, after which the decree, Doctor of Divinity, was conferred upon him. On the 1st of June of 1823, Heber was formally consecrated as the Bishop of Calcutta at Lambeth Palace by the Archbishop of Canterbury. Two weeks later, he departed for India with Amelia and his daughter Emily. Heber remained there from 1823 until his death in 1826. Reginald Heber traveled extensively during his short time in India, but his health was not strong. He cared deeply for his people, his family, his post, and his writings reflect his devotion to his mission. During his travels, the bishop became aware of things which hindered the Christian mission's work and wished to pass on to the governor general, Lord Amherst, much of what he had learned. On his return to Calcutta after one such trip, he busied himself with a series of detailed reports. He also wrote to Williams Wynn in London, strongly criticizing the East India Company's stewardship of its Indian territories. He was concerned that few Indians were promoted to senior posts. He noted the bullying, insolent manner toward the Indians that was typically adopted by the British. Many local matters also demanded Heber's attention. The next phase in the development of Bishop's College, the preparation of a Hindustani dictionary, the series of ordinations, including that of Abdul Masih, an elderly Lutheran whose reception into Anglican orders had earlier been resisted by Bishop Middleton on unspecified grounds. In spite of the pressures on his time, Heber set out again on the 30th of January, 1826, this time heading south from Madras, now known as Chennai, and Pondicherry, Tanyore, and ultimately Travancore. One reason for this tour was to examine the issue of caste. Caste persisted in the church in South India. In Tanjore on Easter Day, 26 March of 1826, Heber preached to more than 1,300 people. On the following day, he conducted a confirmation service for the large Tamil congregation. On the 1st of April, he moved to Trinopoli, where the next day he confirmed 42 people. On April the 3rd, after attending an early morning service at which he gave a blessing in the Tamil language, Heber returned to his bungalow for a cold bath. Immediately after plunging into the waters, he died. It is thought possibly from the shock of the cold water and that intense heat of India. Biographer Watson records that a contemporary engraving shows Heber's body, quote, being carried from the bath by his servant and chaplain, the latter immaculately attired in a frock coat and top hat. Heber's funeral was held the next day at St. John's Church where he had preached his final sermon, and he was buried within the church on the north side of the altar. At the start of the 19th century, Anglican authorities officially disapproved of the singing of hymns in church, other than metrical psalms, although there was considerable informal hymn singing in parishes. Heber, according to the poet John Bettigeman, was a professed admirer of the hymns of John Newton and William Cowper. He was one of the first high church Anglicans to write his own hymns. In all, Heber wrote 57 hymns, mainly between 1811 and 1821, before he went to India. Heber wished to establish his hymns in a collection in which he proposed to include some by other writers. In October of 1820, he sought the help from the Bishop of London, William Howley, in obtaining official recognition of his collection from the Archbishop of Canterbury. 
In a non-committal reply, Howley suggested that Heber should publish the hymns, although he proposed to withhold Episcopal approval until public reaction could be gauged. Heber began preparing the publication, but was unable to complete arrangements before his departure for India in 1823. The collection was eventually published in 1827, after his death, as hymns written and adapted to the weekly church service of the year. Another well-known and beloved hymn written by Bishop Heber is the oft-sung Holy, Holy, Holy. It matches well with the one we're looking at today. Heber's widow recalls that when they learnt of his death, his friends in Oxford opened a subscription for a monument to perpetuate Heber's memory, describing him in their advertisement as a man, quote, distinguished in this university by his genius and learning, virtuous and amiable in private life, and thoroughly devoted to the great cause in which his life was lost, end quote. Such a monument, his friends felt, would transmit, quote, to posterity a record of his imminent services in the propagation of Christianity in India, end quote. The funds were soon accumulating. The subscription was then opened in London as well and extended to include, quote, the endowment of an oriental scholarship, end quote. At length, this plan bore fruit. The monument is the work of Mr. Jean Trey, and his widow explains. It is that of a colossal figure of the bishop kneeling on a pedestal in the attitude of devotion, with one hand on his bosom, the other resting on the Bible. Like Stephen, Bishop Heber's insistence at excellent work and enduring the challenges of each post made a difference to all who knew him, learned from him, and saw his consistent message of the cross to the world. His life and his death made a difference then and makes a difference now for any and all who would learn of this man, his devotion, and his Lord. His life is an example of our character quality for this month, endurance as opposed to discouragement. Endurance, the inward strength to withstand stress so as to accomplish God's best while experience the power of God's love by rejoicing in the trials and the tribulations that God allows. Hebrews 10 and 36 reminds us, for you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. Saints, we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. May we all be one who is part of that crowd. Just as a side note, Heber's work has also been used in secular settings, as in the novella The Man Who Would Be King, written in 1888 by Rudyard Kipling, although Kipling included reworked lyrics. Now filmmakers have also included this song, using an older Irish tune, the Maureen, which provided the foundation of The Minstrel Boy, which was an Irish patriotic song written by Thomas More. The film The Man Who Would Be King, written in 1975 and directed by John Huston, included Heber's song within the storyline. In religious use, this song is most often sung to All Saints New, which was the tune written specifically for this work in 1872 by Henry Stephen Cutler, a composer who is also known as the pioneer of the American Boy Choir. <laughs> 